How did you sleep last night after the movie? of the action scenes and whatever. Uh, I remember years ago I had a friend who, who uh, asked her to watch The Matrix and she only watched 10 minutes of The Matrix and she said, I absolutely had to turn it off. She said, it's just absolutely too violent uh, to watch that movie. And I said, well, uh, maybe you should just look again with it and then take notes with your emotions as they come up. Because I said, you know, the violence is really in the mind. You know, judgment is what the violence is. And we are frequently told about violent movies or violent scenes and so on and so forth. But it, again, it puts the violence out in the world where it can never be healed. Uh, because it's, that's part of a projection or part of a way of distracting away from what's going on in your mind, in your consciousness. So, so it's always good to just pay close attention to your emotions. Uh, there's chase scenes or cars sprawling on trucks. <laughs> Some interesting scenes with that Mack truck uh, <laughs> last night. <laughs> big, like barbell kind of things just rolling down the highway. Uh, quite an unusual scene. <laughs> but uh, we do have the uh, extras if you ever want to watch the extras on that. <laughs> uh, they, had, they had fun filming that. <laughs> They had one day of going out and they were like, okay, let's go for it today, let's really go for it. And they had a ball. <laughs> I need a copy for Tina because she never watches Yeah. I was more intrigued watching you though, David. I was watching you watching the screen as though you were seeing it for the first time. So you're almost a child like uh, and you. Yeah. In fact, we talked about it afterwards, and I said, look at David, he's watching this, he's never seen it before. Yeah. And it must have been the umpteen time you'd seen it, yeah. but you were utterly in the present moment when you were watching it. Every scene was like a moment in time, and you were utterly absorbed in the scene. Just yeah. to watch it. That's why I can watch them over and over. Yeah. And it's, <laughs> they say, have you seen this one before? It doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Well, that's what children do, you know, they watch the movies, yeah. same yeah. movie over and over, yeah. day after day after day. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, I mean, it's good. That's, that's kind of an incentive for it. That's the result of all this mind training, so that you can just be present and you really feel a sense of joy when you're in that presence. So it really doesn't matter what you're watching and so forth. And it's really good in, in terms of demonstrating peace and love and joy and happiness because it doesn't really matter then what the scene is. Um, when I first went to Argentina, it was Buenos Aires, it was a city of like over 15 or 16 million people and not a lot of pollution controls and just what the world might consider kind of dirty, unorganized, and then people everywhere and everything. But I 
just was really enjoying the whole experience because I wasn't judging anything that was occurring, so it didn't really matter things like noise level. Um, I've had people that have been into spirituality for years that that even like a Christian science practitioner, someone who's a highly trained mind, but but if there's like somebody, uh, one time a Christian science practitioner called me up and she's had done so many healings and people would call her up and just to join with her and join with God, but uh, it was a hot day in Philadelphia and everyone had their windows open and somebody was playing their rap music uh, full blast on their ghetto blaster. And she called me up, I can't take it, I just cannot take it, <laughs> this rap music, you know. And so there was, I said, ah, there, there was a claim, <laughs> a claim that there is no God. <laughs> if there's something that like irritates you or annoys you even, or stirs up things, and that's like, they call it in Christian science, a claim. It would be like when you go to an insurance agent and you make a claim, you're wanting to collect on your policy. And when you make a claim in this world, it's like saying, uh, there is no God, I'm justified in feeling irritated, annoyed, upset, and it's like filing a claim with the higher bureau <laughs> and saying, hey. <laughs> I noticed everyone laughed at the line last night when the guy said, uh, you know, when you pray to God, do you really, really want something? God's the one that ignores us. <laughs> Everybody's had that feeling. I just saw it from like God knows nothing of this world. Like, you know, you've already been given given everything. So, you know, (laughs) what do you need to ask for anything? Yeah. Yeah. That's good, though. That's like the petitioning. When the mind believes in scarcity and lack, it always has plenty of things to petition for. And uh, and God seems to be the one that's supposed to to answer all the requests. if you think of that, the prayer is always answered, but it's like, again, you, you really have to get clear on what are you praying for. If you're always being answered, and you have a form that comes that you don't like, then then you have to get deeper down to what am I really praying for? What is it that I'm desiring here, you know, that I, that I feel less than or lacking in some way? And that helps you really undo the ego in a hurry. Uh, when you start to really take a look at that. If I was created whole and complete, and I'm striving after something, you know, what makes that something so important to me? That really unravels the string, so to speak. It really helps you let go of the the self-concept. And that's how it it happened for me, you know, when I would ask these practical questions, when I would feel upset about anything, I would say, gee, I feel very defensive. And then I would say to the Holy Spirit, I said, what am I uh, defending against with all of this defensiveness? And the simple answer was love. That love is just trying to reach our hearts all the time. It's just like a, a beam of light which just wants to reach our hearts so much. And then, at first it was like, well, is it really? <laughs> is that what I'm defending against love? It just doesn't seem possible that I could put so much energy into being so afraid of you know, defending against love. And then, so I said, okay, well, let's try a different angle there. Uh, <laughs> uh, what am I defending for? You know, what, if I'm defending against love, what am I protecting? Maybe this will be help, more helpful. That's <laughs> because I don't get this part about defending against love. You know, I always think I want love. But then it was, you're defending for, you're protecting a self-concept that was made up to take the place of your divinity. So all your defense mechanisms are made up to defend, to protect that self-concept. And and you're afraid that you won't know who you are if you let go of that image that that was made by the ego. It's like, it seems very much like the the Buddhist term of, of dropping into the void, because as you're going deeper and deeper and you're letting go of all these things, it feels like you're going into emptiness or nothingness. And uh, who wants to be nothing? <laughs> you know, we've, we've heard that enough from our parents sometimes when we were children. You are nothing. <laughs> but you know, when we get older, it's like, no, there's, I want to be something. 
But something is the problem, you know, to be a thing when we were created as spirit. Then it seems like you're dropping down into the void of, of emptiness and nothingness. And all we have with Jesus or Jeshua is, is we have an expression that it's okay, keep dropping and drop through that hole, uh, even if it feels like you're going down the sink uh, and you just kind of drop down into the sink, you know, it's okay, go through the hole. Come through the keyhole, I've been there. Uh, it's like he's saying, take a dive, splash in. You know, the water's warm, uh, it's inviting. And, and that's very important, I think, you know, that's, that's where the message of love, no matter how much we talk about release, no matter how much we talk about forgiveness, no matter how much we talk about letting go, it's okay to really get in touch with that feeling and that experience of the love as best as you can, because that love, that grace, is so important. You know, that's what's, what's there, that's what is. That's what forever is so, and it's just a matter of being aware of it. And all the clearing away is simply uh, making your mind ready to experience that love. And one thing that's sort of come up for me lately is really, you know, I really don't know what love is. Because, I mean, we have all these emotional things seeming to go on, and they all come and pass. Like, you know, you have sort of joy rising, but they all pass through, you know. Like, and I know, like, you know, it will, like, I want to felt really deep, deep peace, and, you know, like, wake up in the morning and feeling, you know, waking myself up singing to myself because I'm just so, you know, it's like, oh, and uh, there's almost something watching me going, oh my God, look how incredible this is. So even like the sense of love, it's like I still, you know, what is that sort of thing? I know, you know, feeling at peace and calm and feeling just happy for no reason at all. But it's still like the idea of love. It's still like a complete concept that, you know, it, it seems to me often a bit, um, thought of as some emotional sort of thing, but it, you know, the whole point of it is true that what I am is love, but it can't really be an emotional thing that comes and goes. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, in The Course in Miracles, Jesus says you have but two emotions, love and fear, so he's even calling love an emotion in that <coughs> sentence, but, but we could say that love has many derivatives or there are many aspects of it, and the peace, joy, freedom, happiness, you know, you could fill in the blanks, bliss, and so on and so forth, those would all be derivatives or almost synonyms, we could say, for, for love, and then fear, and guilt, and shame, and pain, and anxiety, and depression, and on and on and on, uh, would be anything that's upsetting, we could say, you know, would be that. And again, the whole point is to simplify things, even if you do it down to the basics of love and fear, or right mind and wrong mind, um, it gets very basic. You start to realize that, that you could just summarize the entire human condition uh, in terms of, of, of a couple terms, and that makes it very simple. It kind of cuts through all these layers of complexity that this world seems to have, which makes the world seem very mysterious, actually all these layers of complexity. You know, where you even hear spiritual teachers say, life is a mystery. Uh, or, um, I always tell the story about my friend, uh, Jim Werderman, who was, uh, he was a priest for many years, a very tall man, six foot nine, and uh, he finally, his brother was a priest and lived and died as a priest, and he was in the priesthood, and he just couldn't reconcile certain things, so he got into A Course in Miracles, he met his wife and had a child, and, and he spent maybe 20 some years uh, in A Course in Miracles. But he would come to a lot of my gatherings and, and he would watch the Holy Spirit kind of pour through. And he would say, I've never heard you stumped on a question. I've never heard like a pause or a hesitation or some, some kind of delay or whatever it just comes pouring through you. And he said, It's not my experience. He said, I, when I was doing taking confessions, you know, in the confessional, the people would come in all the time with these 
confessions and questions, and he said, whenever I didn't know the answer to the question, I would just say, it's a divine mystery. <laughs> that was his out. He said, I always had to say something. So he just said, it's a divine mystery. And then, but he said, you don't ever use that. <laughs> you never put those words together, divine mystery. I said, well, no, God wants to be openly revealed. There is no mystery in God or in love. But it's the layers of ego complexity that give the mystique, that give the mystery to this world. And they even, it can even make love seem very mysterious. Like it's this thing like, what is it? I think a lot of us have had very powerful experiences and you could say that's like a glimpse. And the only difference between the glimpse of love and love is that love is constant and a glimpse is temporary. So you can tell that even the glimpse is powerful as it can be, you mean kind of, it can knock your socks off, it can just feel like it blows your mind, and yet it's temporary. And, and of course in miracles Jesus describes revelation that way. It's like the great rays, or having experience, of, a direct experience of this light that's beyond the veil, uh, is called revelation. But even revelation in this world is temporary, because he says, if you experience direct revelation, in a sustained way, the world would not last. You would literally have to, have to have the disappearance of the universe. Because that world of perception, of images that covers over the light, you know, couldn't last, uh, couldn't stand the light, you might say. It would just completely evaporate. And so, he does say that, you know, very few have attained direct union with God, and in the sense of in this world, of course, <laughs> they, they wouldn't seem to be around much, or they wouldn't seem to even be able to perceive the world if they were in a sustained experience. So we could say that that ex sustained experience of light is really what love is. So and it's kind of like you're leading into what's been coming up into my mind lately, because like, if my mind goes to that point and starts going to light, I kind of go, if it just kept on opening up into that, there's no way I could stay here. Like there's no way I could set, sustain a world. So it kind of leads into like, well, how do you just be at peace? Something that seems to hold the world, you know, have a world. Yeah. Because if I really am connecting with the light, I can't really keep a world going. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's, that's the perfect lead into our theme for today. The that's the absolutely perfect lead in because because you you want a st state of rest or peace. And how do you rest and still <laughs> see a world, is really the question. How do you really, really rest and see a world? And so, and the question did come up uh, yesterday, I believe, about how do we be in the world but not of it. Um, that phrase is an interesting phrase, in the world but not of it. Uh, in the sense that the more you go into it metaphysically, you start to, to really kind of see that that's kind of impossible to be in the world but not of it. It's like, how can you be a figure in the dream and be a, the dreamer uh, at the same time? You can't. <laughs> you can't hold both positions. You can't, in quantum physics terms, you can't be the observer and behold the field, the, the unified quantum field, and be in the field in a particular or specific way. Because if you're the whole, you can't be a part. And we've all heard that the whole transcends the sum of the parts. In actuality, the whole is real, and there are no parts. You see how that goes one step above the whole transcends the sum of the parts, as if the parts are real and they can be added together. And it's like, no, this, is, this goes, we could say, to another level, or it goes beyond that. So, it's it's starting to realize that, that the whole problem of this world involves part-whole thinking. As long, as long as we think in terms of parts and wholes, then we still have a problem that needs to be corrected. Let's use the metaphor of a hologram. You know, that when you hear about a hologram, they tell you that each part of a hologram contains the whole. That's a real mind-bender. <laughs> Each part contains the whole. How can that 
B if the whole is all that there is and that there are no parts. So you might say, or fractals. Some of you have probably looked into fractals and there's all kinds of interesting things, but the replication of things, it seems like this whole cosmos is built on fractals. Just images that replicate and replicate and replicate, uh, almost like uh, uh, just a cascading replication that's going on, and yet that's all part of the misperception because it still involves parts. So, in the end, it's like a yielding into or a surrender into a, a state of, of completion where the whole tapestry uh, comes together and you see the whole tapestry as one. And as well, you realize that you are unified, uh, that, that you are all aspects of that tapestry. So there's no perceiver and perceived. There's no observer and observed. There's no subject and no object. That's really where the, the splintering occurs. It's in perception where it seems like there could be an aspect of consciousness that is doing the observing and an aspect that is observed, or you know, subject-object that way. And, and once you yield past that split in consciousness, then you have the unified sense of consciousness, the unified field. And then, of course, you have no problems, because problems only came from duality, from believing that there was two. Two of anything. You know, it doesn't really matter two of what, but the belief that there could be two of anything sets up all kinds of strange concepts, like comparison. Uh, comparison is a very, very strange concept. It's unknown in heaven. Uh, competition uh, is a very strange concept as well. It seems like the economic system, it seems like competition is is built into the human being in the sense of siblings competing, uh, competition between neighbors and uh, between countries, competition for in the food chain, you know, it seems like this whole world is is based on this idea. And as soon as you are understanding that the unified field doesn't know about competition, then you have to be vigilant in your mind against the idea. Uh, you have to really watch your mind so that anytime something competitive arises, you quickly hand it over to the Holy Spirit. Because that idea will only foster or maintain a sense of conflict in the mind. And it doesn't matter really what aspect of your life that you're talking about. If, if that competitive <coughs> urge arises, then it's like, okay, I just need to hand this over. This has served me no, to no end, and it's, it's not going to serve me at, at all. So I'm going to release that aspect. Uh, sometimes people would say to me, yeah, it's good, don't, don't compete against other people, just compete against yourself. Uh, and I'd be like, Oh, that sounds <laughs> terrible. <laughs> you know, like like they say, oh, I don't I don't compete in any kind of races anymore or this and that. I just go out with a stopwatch. And <laughs> so then you bring time into it and use time to divide yourself up into a human being who's competing for a better time, you know, a, a quicker time in the mile or in the 10 k race or something, you know. And, and again. The mind can distract itself in many things in this world, and that's one of them, is trying to get into self-improvement. Mm -hmm. And I would always say, if God created you perfect, then why do you need to, to improve yourself? Uh, you were perfect from the beginning, in eternity, and, and look at all the self-help books. I mean, you really have to be discerning when you go to your metaphysical bookshelf, or you go to your New Age shop and you pick up the self-help book. It's like, okay, which self is it that needs all this help? <laughs> you know, so, you know, you could, you know you, you're going to start to eliminate a lot of things very quickly when you start to just get into these real basic things like, well, I want to accept my perfection. I'm not really interested in making a better and better uh, smaller self and trying to puff, puff up a smaller self. And when you hear words like, um, <coughs> A lot of times I'll hear teachers talk about self-esteem. We want to increase children's self-esteem. Again, you have to ask the question, 
what self is it that needs to have this esteem increased? And how, how much is enough? I mean, what are we talking about? And the teachers say, well, you know, we want to help them have better grades. Oh, better grades. So that puts a lot of pressure on, on the children, you know, to, to keep up in terms of grades and comparisons and standards so that they can get into schools to learn more separation, more fragmentation, and then only to make it into university and graduate school where they can become more specialized in fragmentation. Uh, you know, you start to see the whole system is really uh, flawed. I remember when I was in university that I, I was given a graduate project in the College of Education to research education. And so I did a lot of research. I mean, all kinds of different schools of thought. I went back and looked in through the centuries. And uh, there was a guy named Ivan Illich who basically came to the conclusion that the educational system was the problem and that he advocated de-schooling society. Uh, so I actually wrote that up and put it into the paper. The, the professors were not at all pleased <laughs> with that. I was in a, a very elite school psychology program and they were training me to, to do Stanford Binet's and, and Ways and Intelligence uh, test. And, and I'm writing a paper on, I, I really like this guy's ideas, de-school society. Oh, you know, it was like, well, we've got a real rebel. <laughs> But that was, that was the year right before The Course in Miracles came into my life, so it was almost a symbol that I was being drawn to those kind of, of ideas, because it just felt like uh, it was time to start letting go of a lot of things. And then I stepped out of the whole academic wheel uh, after ten years in university, just realizing that, that all that could be used. I had no regrets about any of it, but it was like, this can just be used now by the Holy Spirit, you know, in helpful ways free the mind and free up all this sense of, uh, of pressure that's built on learning and how much have I learned and stuff like that.
see the different activities that I see in the same experience. I've gone to some homes and I've gagged people. I guess that's what's kept me alive. And then it got to the point that I feel no fulfillment at all because of my attempts to find that connection with others. I just constantly, people always came in and out of my life. There was no one ever really stayed. The really amazing people that are in my life, I'm very blessed to see them a couple of times a year. So, and I felt that the only thing to do was to fully find that experience of God and I wanted to know God's love totally. So I spent, and you already know, but I spent seven years doing that. So I've got questions around experiences that I had too, especially that one that you referred to in our thing. So connected to my experiences where I felt like I would literally disappear if I didn't find myself. That's a bit of a subject, but it just, it's an awful thing for me to talk about. So many different things that occurred to me and to actually really experience it not coming from anywhere, not being treated by anything. So that fullness of God's love is what I just kept on wanting more of and so I did indeed feel that. And I guess that opened me so much that there was a natural desire to want to connect to people. And I haven't been able to get past one of these walls that I've experienced. They're coming out of such an expanded sense of awareness. It's kind of like I've lived so much, I've had so much awareness, so much going on, and I've been in this miscommunication of voice. I haven't been able to express that or even get, not even, just to find that connection. And then last year, when I was at a really low point, I was just absolutely at the bottom and I just really, really pleaded and asked for the next step that was supposed to be done. And then I, yeah, I just got directed to, bought this newspaper, I never buy newspapers, and found this article which I never would have read in the news and I didn't think that I would read it. Anyway, it was about the Spurgeous Syndrome, which I didn't research, and I was tested and that's what I was diagnosed with. And a lot of people probably don't know, but it's actually a mild form of autism. So if there's a scale and there's normal and neurotypical people and then there's autism at the other end, the Spurgeous lies in the middle. So it's actually a real brain thing. It's a difference. It's a different wiring. So it kind of explains, you know, how it was so, and I had so much work, not like I was trying to be isolated or alone. It's just that all my attempts just, there was no natural social ability that most people have. That's the biggest thing with this, and I'm not trying to make it an excuse. I'm just sharing my struggle with it, and I know that there's actually a, it's a massive gift in it because it's always generally people with that have some specific gift. But the biggest thing is the loneliness. It's difficult to focus on more than one thing, and so that's why this whole experience for me, when I'm actually expressing, there's so much going on, although I'll say in this kind of situation it is different because it's obviously not, you know, the peace that you bring and the truth, and that's just, you know, that's the way it's spoken. So, yeah, I just, so I've still been, I guess that was a big letting go for me, discovering that last year, a big, because I'd lost so much. I just had no energy or will I could keep pushing anymore. So, you know, in my working life I learned, I copied people, I learned how to do things, that's what I had to do, and that's why I think a lot of people with that have to do that, have to learn how to do things that are natural to them. You know, I can do things that most people take for granted. So, I guess I just wanted to 
to share that with my dad, with my you know, this victim on that, is I have just the natural desire of my heart to want to make those connections with them. I just found it really difficult. And that exercise was wonderful. If I could do it every day for a month, I might be... Um, anyway, that's been like, this like a real brain challenge for me as far as being able to why I think it's why so much fear is coming up in me about surviving. Oh my god, I just, I just, I've dissolved all those coping things. And how do I go back out and bridge that gap and find the people where I can actually connect to it? Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. It's, when the mind is, is again, so afraid of the light, so afraid of, of God's love. It, it makes up a world, a cosmos, and many, many defense mechanisms. And, you know, autism and moving in autistic ways, um, there's really good movies like the one that Kathleen Turner did called uh, House of Cards. It really is a spectacular um, movie that starts to show that, that this kind of isolating mechanism, this closing off and kind of isolating from the world, is a defense, and that it's a call for love. It needs to be appreciated for what it is. And then the opposite, we, we talk about introverts and extroverts, those people that seem to be very good at socializing and, and have lots of friends and, and have lots of big social networks. Uh, the world kind of shows them is, is uh, much more uh, adaptable and, and flexible and so on and so forth. But a lot of socializing, again, gets back into the ego defense of, remember, the ego made up the world, and the ego peopled the world. And, and then it's trying to get the, the mind caught up in these personal relationships as, as its false identity. So a lot of socializing that goes on, you've kind of gone the other direction, but a lot of socializing it's, that the world says, oh, that's very good, very good, lots of friends lots of strong family connections and so on and so forth. Good support system, you know, all the kind of things that people say is part of a healthy, healthy functioning adult mind is still part of, of a defense against truth and love. And so, so you begin to see that no matter how it's been wired, the brain, how the brain seems to be wired and everything is a reflection of, of the mind, of the decisions, of the beliefs that are in the mind. So it can seem like the brain, you know, brains do look different and they're wired uh, differently, but they're just reflections of, of beliefs that have to be released in an identity. And you might say that the question really is getting to the sense of what is the value of affection? What is the value of physical closeness? Um, you know, how, where does that fit in the overall context of this awakening? And a lot of it depends on, on how the defense mechanisms have been used. For example, uh, I get a chance, I've been in 21 different countries, so I can, as I go to different societies, different societies have different <coughs> standards and rules and mores uh, about uh, affection and touch. You know, for example, if you go to like the uh, United States and Great Britain and certain ones, you know, there's, there's definitely a sense of like a private space uh, that's, that's surrounding the persona, you know, it's like don't invade. Uh, and, and I would say not necessarily those countries, but once you start to get into a lot of major cities, if you walk through the major cities and you notice people are making a lot of eye contact, they're looking ahead, they're looking down on the sidewalk and everything, they're not even making eye contact, it's a real sense of personal space, then when I first went down to uh, Argentina, for example, it was like hugs and kisses and hugs and kisses everywhere. It's hugs and kisses, you know, when you've come from the United States or Great Britain, it's like, my God. Uh, you know, we were going around, I said, oh, you have to get some currency change, some money changed, and they took me to the, the bank. And I was looking across the way at another bank, and there was two security guards, and they're in full uniform with pistols and gear and everything. And one is relieving 
they have a kind of like in Great Britain, they have the changing of the guards, you know, very formal. Well, these two guys come up there and all of a sudden they're embracing and kissing. <laughs> I've heard of the macho man, but it's like really just stretches. And then when I went to stay with my friend Maria, you know, she was there every time. It was like an extended family, but any time a, a family member would leave the house, it was kiss, 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 it was hugs and kisses all the way around. When they'd go, leave, I'm going out to get some milk. <laughs> and so and then at night time came, and before they would go to sleep, you know, like when you little kids, your mom would give you like bedtime hugs and kisses. Before the family members go, there was hugs and kisses to go to sleep. And then, you know, you go, I've been over in Europe recently, more recently, and uh, with there's different countries, Belgium, I think Belgium wasn't that the triple kiss, I, it was like some of the places, like, <laughs> France was like the double kiss, it was like a kiss on each cheek, and then I went to Belgium and they kind of smiled and said, ah, yes, the French, just give you two. One. <laughs> was like, oh my gosh. And this is what I mean by the conditioning. It's wired, it's just conditioned. And so part of it is breaking away from our past conditioning. You know, that's part of learning to follow the Holy Spirit. Whatever your conditioning was, uh, it's, it's the Holy Spirit will try to guide you beyond that condition. So if you if you've been raised and you kind of become accustomed to a certain level of affection or whatever, and you have a circle with the, with the eye gazing, with the, with the music playing, with opening your heart up, it, it can feel like that's where your heart is. Like saying, "Let's." I wish I could do this all day long. You know, it's just a call in your mind to be really open doing much more experiential kind of things like that, you know, that the time for reading books and, you know, doing those kind of things is, is past, you know, you, you know it, you have that wisdom inside of you and you have to move into much more of an experiential and be guided by the spirit, you know, to, to open up that way. Uh, there was a singer-songwriter that traveled with me back in like 1991, 1992, I think, and Donna Marie Carey, and we would she hit her guitar and she would just let the spirit come pouring through her and I would tell lots of parables and some metaphysics depending on the church or the group that we were invited to, what would be appropriate, uh, what they could handle. And it turned back into revivals. We, between the music <laughs> and the, the parables, people were opening their hearts up. And then we began going to churches and doing a lot of experiential exercises like you were participating in this morning. And people that had been in the same congregation and had sat in the pews next to each other for 20, 30, 40 years, and oh, there was mascara all over the place. It was, just, it was, just, it was everywhere. It, was, it, was, it, was, it looked more like, like Halloween or something. But, but we were simply doing all these um, diet work. Um, singing that song that she had written, you know, I'm willing to open my eyes to see your innocence, to see the child you are, a mirror of myself, and singing this over and over, and then switching partners, and switching partners, and switching partners. So basically the minister and people in the whole congregation that had never been in touch with such intense emotions, they were crying all over the place. And at the end they said, wow, that felt good. Uh, that felt really good. So. So this is where it, it comes into following your guidance. Now, I would say again that this, that kind of a phase with the experiential stuff and, and even with closeness in terms of bodies, uh, in the Course of Miracles Jesus says, minds are joined, bodies do not. That's kind of an interesting statement, bodies do not. <laughs> you cannot join bodies. Uh, and so he says, he talks about revelation, this sense of light that we were talking about, and he says that, that in this world people will attempt uh, to find that light, to find that sense of deep connectedness and intimacy through proximity, through closeness with bodies. And, and it's not possible, he says. So it's good to know, I mean it's like, okay, give it to me straight. Can I find it there or not? He's saying no. It's, it's like, he says, the miracle. You have to find this intimacy through miracles. That's why he titled the book, A Course in Miracles. 
which many people think is kind of a strange name, actually. A course in what? <laughs> Miracles? But what, do I have to walk on water or part the Red Sea or, you know, like Bruce Almighty, divide the, the cup of tomato, tomato soup, you know, oh, you know, what do I have to do uh, to achieve this sense of miracles? But it's no, it's not any of that stuff either. It's the sense of joining, just joining and being in alignment with spirit, following those guides, those prompts that come. And that if you keep listening to those inner prompts and you keep following, you will get happier and happier and happier. I spent, I got to spend a little time with Les, Les up, up in Palm Cove, and he was telling me all these, he's a captain, airline pilot for Qantas, but he had an adventure over in the United States where he just went over and, what was the phrase you used, I'm here to throw myself to the wind? myself to the wind. Yeah, he just kept telling people over and over, I'm here to meet the people of, the, of America and throw myself to the wind. And then people started just showing up and saying, well, come on my plane. You know, when you're a pilot, you can kind of ride like a shotgun or what they call it on those things. And he was taken all over the different cities. He had no plan. He just showed up and said, I'm here to just throw myself to the wind. And all these miracles started happening. And that's getting closer to that sense of this deep intimacy that we want, that we're really yearning for, you know, that's deep in our hearts, is by listening and following and letting go of a lot of structure, control, uh, a lot of past associations that stand in the way, uh, including those even around affection. You know, a lot of people um, just don't allow themselves to access certain deep emotions because they've just got it wired about what's appropriate and inappropriate and crossing over boundary lines, you know, that are all made up, they're just all mental. And so, as you just step into it more and more and say, okay, guide me, show me, I do not know the way to you, but I'm willing to follow. I'm willing to follow your internal prompts. That's how it starts to open up. And that can go the other way too, when you sort of tend to the impulse to be affectionate. Like I'm saying, you know, there's like impulses when it's like, you know, stand still and someone's coming towards you and your impulse is to kind of go out just actually stand still and not move in that direction and let whatever sort of arises to Yes, it Come really, on. really has to become very intuitive. Like, I, when I travel around to a lot of different Course in Miracles groups and a lot of different churches, um, I would notice that they, people would have, the groups would have like hugging rituals. And the reason, the way you can tell a hugging ritual is when at the end of the gathering people go, I haven't hugged so and so, I mean, it's like, it's like a search mission, you know, like, there's 20 people in the room, and they're like going around, I haven't hugged you, and I haven't hugged you, you know, it's anything, the ego can turn anything into a ritual, including hugging, you. something as simple and basic as that. And that's when you really have to be very intuitive with it, because, you know, it's, it's, it's the intention. Also, I'm sure you've all had hugs from somebody that just comes up and just kind of hugs you, everything, and you can't really feel anything <laughs> with it. There's got to be that guidance behind it, the, the real extending of love, you know. Whether you're hugging someone, whether you're cooking food, whether you're taking a walk, you know, you want to have that sense of presence that's there. So you feel f free and open, and there's no sense of, of, of it being a ritual. You know, you, don't, you lose this whole idea of rituals and things having to be, you know, repeated a certain way to, to achieve some kind of future outcome. Please now share something. I'm, I'm really emotional hearing your story because I work in the field of disabilities and the most profound experience I ever had was I worked with a, um, a man who was 40 years of age Asperger's. And I've worked as a counsellor for many years and I never broke down and cried. But I loved him so much, real back that God's love. And I worked with him for two years. <coughs> and then one day I pushed him a little too hard. 
and he closed the door on me and I couldn't stop the tears. I couldn't stop them and I just said to him, you can choose, you can choose now and that's a good thing because you have grown, you, you have grown in the time. You can choose now and that's great because you've grown and you can now choose that you don't want to work with me anymore. So that's a beautiful thing. So I've always given him that freedom to be who he was and didn't judge him. And and I just said, but oh, I love you. And I've always loved you. Let's break all of the rules. <laughs> all of the rules in counseling books. And I always break the rules anyway. So <laughs> I don't work in a traditional way. And I just couldn't stop. I just blowed, 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 blowed. And he just looked at me and said, I don't know what's happening here. I don't know what's happening here. I don't know what's happening here. And I guess what I really wanted to say to you is open the door to love because it is there. <laughs> Only you close that door. <laughs> it's a tough world when you're a little bit different. Very courageous, like you said, even speaking up in a group, you know, it's a very courageous, bold move to kind of turn the tables on the ego and say, you know, I'm not going to be frightened and hold, hold it in anymore. And, and it's amazing when you just let it come up and let it come out in an uncensored way, that begins to undo this people-pleasing uh, aspect, defense of the ego. Which the ego is just saying, you know, you have to put on a mask and you have to wear a mask. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> I see the healing, the healing for everyone as evidence by the queen. <laughs> Well, I don't wear the scarf. <laughs> <laughs> if I could wear the scarf. That's, 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 that's for everyone. You know, it's, it's a gift to yourself, but it's a gift to everyone when we give ourselves permission to, as we say, take the lid off of it or to just put it out, put it out on the table and everything. I had a, a songwriter who, his name was Vincent. He was from Belgium and he so much wanted to travel with me and he brought his keyboard along and he recorded a CD and he was so happy and we were at this house up in, in Boston. He got his keyboard set up and he was there and 
he looked down at everybody and he just froze. He was uh, in terror. Uh, I don't know what it was, uh, whether it was performing or it was the terror of being in a Course in Miracles group and, or being in a group with me or whatever, but he just was up there. His fingers just froze on the keyboard. He couldn't, he couldn't even play one note. I mean, there he was all set up, ready to go. And so he did, the only thing he could do was he took his hands away from the keyboard and he just said, he looked everybody in the eye and he just said, I'm terrified. I'm absolutely terrified. He didn't. You know, he said, I've always thought, oh my God, as a musician, that would be the worst thing that could ever happen. And he said, I'm terrified, and he, he started talking about it. And the more they talked, he talked for four or five minutes, people came up, they gave him extra hugs, <laughs> thank you for sharing, you know, I mean, it just popped through. And he was with me for like four or five stops. By the final stop, he was so animated. Remember, you person probably remembers that. He would, he could hardly keep his feet even on the ground. He was bouncing around, <laughs> singing, and all these metaphysical songs from the chorus were pouring through him. And everybody was like enlivened and singing with him and everything. And it was just a huge shift. But the first step was that step of being willing to not hide and protect it. It's that fear of rejection. It's the fear of. How will people see me? You know, will people see me as weak? You know, all these other kind of things. And the opposite happens. You know, when you really are willing to do it, then all of a sudden something breaks, some, the tension breaks on the inside, and then the witnesses, the sharings come forth. And that is what this healing is about. It's about not hiding and protecting these thoughts. As if you've owned them, as if they're your identity as if you don't want to share them because it will only bring a rejection or criticism or something onto you, it, as if it, it flies in the face of a lot of, of past memories, maybe, where you, you had this precious thing to share, like a pearl to share, and then when you shared it, there seemed to be a, a reaction or a sense of non-acceptance. All that conditioning, all that wiring, all those memories, you know, now have to be undone. And you're just taking a bold, bold step today by doing what you've done. And it's really for everyone. You can see that everyone can relate to it. It, it gets you this feeling like it's not a personal problem, like it's just like a, a, a healing, hu human healing for all human beings. Even the ones we can't see, you know, throughout the universe, you know, are all touched by, by this openness. So thank you. David, no private thoughts. Is that coming to that category? Yeah, our, we, our two guidelines are no private thoughts and no people pleasing. And mm -hmm. uh, I think people pleasing is one of the most uh, sneaky and insidious uh, of all defenses because it's so ingrained and so socially mm -hmm. and accepted. Uh, of putting on a mask and smoothing things over and, and trying to. Uh, trying to maintain an illusion of stability when inside there's so much turmoil that there's anything but stability. It reminds me of, of a, a, a movie I saw many years ago with Chevy Chase and uh, Goldie Hawn. It's called Foul Play. And Barry Manilow recorded the theme song for the movie. And so it comes out, the theme song goes, you remind me I live in a shell, safe from the past and doing okay, but not very well. <laughs> no jolts, no surprises, no crisis arises. My life goes along as it should. It's all very nice, but not very good. <laughs> and then the chorus is, and I ready to take a chance again, ready to put my love on the line with you, been living with nothing to show for it, you get what you get when you go for it. You know, it's just a, I was just like a movie theater going, whoa. And, and the scenes that we're on was the Pacific Highway, Pacific Coast Highway in, in California, you know, up there where and, and we're coming, our car was coming around in this giant vista of the Pacific Ocean, 
opened up right when he was saying, and I'm ready to take a chance again. It was like this gigantic vista, this gorgeous vista. And of course, you know, you have this, it was an emotional rush. I never forgot that experience. But the beginning lyrics of that song really say a lot. It's this double kind of thing that's going on. It's all very nice, but not very good, you know. Nice. Another key word is like fine. When, some, when you ask somebody, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine, fine. <laughs> it's, like, it's like an invitation, like, okay, what's up? <laughs> what's really happening? <laughs> Why do you have to keep saying fine over and over? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's so fine. Why? So it's good. It's, it's just breaking through. And the private thoughts is that the ego made up a world where minds seem to be separate instead of one. And that each separate mind seems to have thoughts of its own. And these are all ego thoughts. But the mind that holds on to them believes that it's so guilty and shameful about those private thoughts. But that's why it keeps them private. It's kind of like the feeling is, if anyone ever knew the thoughts that are going through my mind, I would never get loved or accepted. I wouldn't have friends. You know, I, I would just, I would have to crawl away, hide somewhere if anyone knew. And that's why it's, for example, like in uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, People seem to have all these private thoughts. In, in Alcoholics Anonymous, they call it the stinking thinking. And so that's their word for it, instead of private thoughts. They have the stinking what, thinking. What's the word again? Stinking thinking. Stinking <laughs> is, is short for stinking. Stinking thinking. And, and so they have this, and then they get into alcoholism or drug abuse or whatever, because it's just a way to distract away from the pain and the hurt. Of the, of the aloneness, of the isolation, and so on and so forth. And then when they join Alcoholics Anonymous or 12-step groups, they're astonished when they start to hear other people speaking, because they feel like only they had this problem. And suddenly that's what the value of a support group is. It's like, oh my gosh, I thought I was the only one in the whole world that had this crazy thoughts and these crazy uh, emotions, but now I see. And then the more they stay with it, the more they start to hear patterns. Mm -hmm. And after a while they start to go, yeah, it's this ego thing. We're, we're all exposing this one ego thing that seems to grip all of our minds. But that's what the private thoughts are about. And when I say no private thoughts, it, it doesn't mean that you should indiscriminately just walk up. I mean, people take this idea and they go home and they go, oh, okay, I'm going to have no private thoughts. <laughs> my spouse and my family and everything. And it's like an explosion, like walking into a minefield. Boom, boom, the fireworks begin. <laughs> but it does mean that, that with, with certain emotions, when there's been layers and layers of people pleasing, that as you feel guided to start talking about it, just bringing it into the discussion, uh, as you're guided, uh, it can really bring a lot of, a, a good step in the right direction. Like I had a friend who I worked with her for like two or three years on this idea, and uh, she just got in touch with all this darkness, and all this, she was denying and repressing so much uh, with her friends, at work, with her family, and so forth. And she had two teenagers, a teenage son and a teenage daughter, and she came home after a weekend with me, she came home and told him, she said, I have like not been living my life to the fullest. I have been holding so much in. Uh, basically she was she was picking up she was picking up the clothes for the kids, doing all the washing, cleaning, meals. She was like the maid. <laughs> and the teenagers were like the king and the queen. Uh, and, and she my friend Lisa couldn't understand why she was depressed. <laughs> but, so after she talked with me and we got in touch with all that was going on in the mind, she actually went home and she told her two children, adolescent children, I'm taking the lid off of a lot of thoughts and emotions that I have and things are going to change around here. And basically their response was, no way. <laughs> You're the mom. Uh, 
this is your role, and you're going to play the role, you know, and we're playing our role, and you're going to play yours. And she's like, no, actually, I've talked this through very thoroughly with David, and things are going to change. And so she called me in about a week. I said, how are things have gone this week, and she said, oh, it's like World War III broke out. She said, she said, they were very strong, and they were not going to change, and I was just saying, okay, then the clothes will pile up, and this will this will get dirty, and this and that, because I'm breaking the pattern. I'm just not going to do this anymore. And after about a week, they finally saw that she was very uh, committed in what she was doing, so they said, okay, we're going to take our lids off of our uh, thoughts and emotions too, because we've been playing the game. And then it really got wild. Uh, <laughs> the second week was really, really wild. And then things cleared away. As the, as the months went on, there was a tremendous healing. You know, it was just like all, everybody was playing a game. You know, kind of like that thing that the emperor has no clothes, where everybody's playing along, and it seems to make the illusion of it you know, real, it seems to solidify it, and then when one person says, this is crazy, this is insane, I'm not going to play the game anymore, then that starts the healing process, and it just gets, like Louise Hay one time says, you know, it's like cleaning a turkey pan, you put the, this, after you cook the turkey, you've got this gunk all in the pan, you put the soap and the water in, you scrape a lot, and it gets a lot dirtier. <laughs> it's going to get a lot dirtier before the band gets clean, and that's kind of a nice metaphor for your mind. Okay, I know it's going to get dirtier, it's going to get messier initially, but my friend and her children are now, their children are grown in their 20s, and it's much more harmonious. You know, they have a sense of, they're equals. You know, they, they have a sense of respect. And, but it all started with her just saying, no, I'm not going to... Uh, Play by these old past thoughts and private thoughts. It's tea time. Okay. Wonderful.